visitors experience here the comfort of the Orient Express and the luxurious traveling of the happy few. And we have a few actors who, well, who play, do uh, role playing and uh, give you the idea of being a luxurious traveler in the 19th century. Then we have also interactive exhibitions in our museum, like the Tech Lab, uh, where children and their parents discover all sorts of technical aspects of the train. They get answers on questions like how does a steam locomotive work, how does an electrical train get its electricity, and so on. Um, well, it's good to know that we don't get any financial support of the Dutch government. Some 25% of our income consists of support of the Dutch railways, but the other 75% we have to earn ourselves by selling tickets, of course, and by organizing events like Thomas the Train, that's a big event of our, ours, or which station during the Christmas period. We also sell special parts of the museum as a location for business events. And before the corona pandemic, we received 420,000 visitors each year. And this year, we hope to receive about 300,000 visitors. Um, besides our permanent exhibitions and events, we organize every year one of two uh, temporary exhibitions. And on the left, you can see a big exhibition we organized about international royal trains. Of royal class, and we also use actors to bring the stories about the royal trains to life. And on the right side, you can see a picture of an exhibition about Mr. Frederick Willem Conrad, first railway engineer and director of the first railway company in the Netherlands around 1839. At the moment, we have an exhibition about the history of postal trains, so we organize every year a different uh, temporary exhibition. Then, about the collections of the Dutch Railway Museum, um, we have six big collections, which are divided in 88 smaller collections. And for example, we have a collection of rolling stock consisting of some 150 different historical trains, locomotives, carriages, wagons, and trains of Dutch railways and their legal predecessors. And I'm responsible for the uh, collections of passengers, flyers, posters, timetables, furnishing of stations, and art, and personal. So I have a lot to do in the railway museum. Um, but we have also have um, it's about a small collection of about 4,000 objects and photographs related to the railways in the Dutch East Indies in the colonial era from about 1864 until 1949. And the biggest part of this collection consists of photographs, but we also have some model, models, posters, documents, and even interviews with people who work at railways in the colonial era. Before I tell you more about this collection, it may be interesting to tell you something about the reasons why the Dutch decided in 1863 to construct the first railroads in the Dutch Indies. The first uh, railway line in the Netherlands was opened in 1839, and immediately after that event, the engineers, politicians, and experts started to discuss if it would be a good idea to build railways in the Dutch Indies. In the first half of the 19th century, uh, Java and Sumatra had waterways and roads for buffalo and horse drawn coaches, which trains would be easier to transport goods and agricultural products, soldiers and passengers. Um, well, with trains it would be fast to transport the colonial products like sugar, tobacco and coffee from the plantations to the harbors. And indeed, transport of, the, of for example, sugar cane became important for several rail railway companies. This photo shows transport of sugarcane between Jakarta and Solo around 1920. The proponents of railways in Java and Sumatra were not alone convinced of the economic advantages, but also of the military advantages. By building railway lines, soldiers and military equipment uh, could be transported faster, which was important to control the colony. Here you can see a picture of our collection of the Aceh line on Sumatra. And so 
Soviets of the Dutch Army, the Koninklijk and Nederlands Indische Leger, KNIL, inspected the NJ line in 1908 and used a very special sort of hand car, or actually, I just would describe it as a railway bicycle. Uh, other pe people saw big advantages of building railway lines in the Dutch Indies for the transport of the European elite in fancy railway cars instead of horse-drawn carriages. The photograph on the left is taken on the occasion of the opening of the line Bogor Bandung of the state railways on the Aga in 1884. And you can see that the European elite is posed by a decorated carriage on that line. And the drawing of the right is an example of an annual report of the Smaran Joana Stolt in Matsapai and illustrated to European train passengers in 1913. And there were even liberal people in the Netherlands who were very enthusiastic about building railway lines on Java and Sumatra because they could stimulate the economic life and welfare of the inhabitants of Java and Sumatra. This photograph shows the so-called Passar train at Surabaya station in 1922. Uh, but there also were fierce opponents in the Netherlands who were convinced that building the railway lines in the Dutch Indies was impossible. In the first place, they worried about the costs. They advised the Dutch politician never build railway lines because investments would be far higher than the output of the income. And they were convinced that the grounds of Java and Sumatra were far too soft for building railways. Besides, they thought the climate was too warm and they warned that all materials, even the rails and the ballast, had to be imported from Europe to Java. For a long time, the Dutch government wasn't interested in building railway lines in the colony at all. The policy was to profit from the colony and not to invest too much. This has everything to do with the cultivation system of Kulturstelsel, invented by Governor Johannes von Bos in 1830. You can see him here on a painting from the collection of the Rijksmuseum. As you certainly know, this system was based on the idea that the colonized people had to pay taxes to the Dutch. They had to pay 20% of their harvest or work 66 days each year as a forced laborer without payment by building roads, bridges and fortresses. The Dutch government had the monopoly on the trade but left the initiative to build railways to private railway companies. And private companies weren't able to use forced laborers. So the opponents of railways in the Dutch Indies warned that private railway companies wouldn't be able to find enough free local laborers to build the railroads. They were of the opinion that such a big infrastructural project was deemed to fail without forced labor. Despite all this opposition, a private Dutch company got a concession to build a railway line on Java in 1863. At the end of that year, the Dutch engineer Jan Philip de Bordes was sent to Java by the Nederlands Indische Spoorwegmaatschappij, the NIS. He hadn't experience with the construction of railways at all, and he never had been, been to a tropical uh, country before. That's very interesting, but I've just uh, have written an article about the way he managed to find enough Japanese workers and Chinese contract workers to build the first line between Samarang and Yogyakarta. Just to give you a very short summary, he realized that it could be, uh, he could only find local worker if, if they paid him, if he paid him enough. So when he started with ground works for the first railway line, he attracted a lot of local workers who earned 90 cents a day. And that was more than a railway worker in the Netherlands earned in that time. The board of the NIS was very angry. This was far too much in their eyes. And soon there were so many local workers who wanted to work for the borders that he was able to lower the wages to a quite normal 50 cents each day. We have two very interesting albums in our uh, collection uh, with photographs of the work of young Philip de 
Cyprus. They are unique. Only the Rijksmuseum, the National Museum in Amsterdam, has also one album in its collection with about 30 pictures, but in our collection there are two albums with in total 66 pictures of the construction of the first railway line between Savannah and Jakarta. These pictures are commissioned by the Boris himself and were made by one of his drawers, a German employee called Carl Lang. By sending this picture to the board of the Nisse per Hague, the boarders hoped to give a good impression of the work he was done and to convince his critical opponents in the Netherlands. The oldest photo in the, of the railway line of Java was taken on August 15th in 1864. It was taken on the sea head near the city of Samara, on the place where the first railway station of Savannah was constructed. We see the borders himself in his white uniform left in the front. Behind him, dressed in white, stand his European employees and engineers. And behind them, we see the first Japanese railway workers. Soon the borders was criticized by experts in the Netherlands because of the high costs of the line. One of the reasons were the high wages for the local railway workers, but another reason was that he used the same railway width as in the Netherlands, normal coach of almost one and a half meter. It was stated that it would be cheaper, cheaper and easier to build railways in smaller widths of about one meter, so-called caps score. Then this railway line became the only one in broad coach, no, European normal coach of Java. I've read all the red letters the borders have sent to the board of the NIS that managed the construction of this railway line for the Hague in the Netherlands. So I learned that the borders had to deal with a lot of misfortune, heat, heavy rains, long years. Sometimes he had to wait for essential materials out of Europe for months. He found two contractors to manage the work, but they failed to do so and were fired. Besides thousands of Japanese railway workers, the borders contracted about thousand Chinese contract workers, but they weren't always reliable in his eyes. Chinese workers protested against the fact that the Japanese workers were paid better, and therefore they sometimes striked and even walked away. No wonder that the cost of the line were higher than expected, and it therefore lasted three years before the first part of the only 25 kilometer railway was ready. The first train ride from Svaring to Tangum took place on August 10th, 1867, but it went by unnoticed. However, the borders hired a photographer of the famous photo agency Woodbury and Page to capture the moment. We see the borders on the left under the porch, with beside him a few NIS employees. In front, we see a Japanese switchman near the switch in the line. The borders went back to the Netherlands in 1869 after conflict with the board of the NIS. In 1870, the cultivation system of Kulturstelsel was abolished. Five years later, in 1875, the Dutch government decided finally to invest in the construction of other railway railways in the colony to promote trade and economy. To this end, the state-owned railways were established in the Dutch East Indies, the Staatsspoorwegen, and the first rail state-owned railway between Surabaya and Pasaruan was opened in 1878, but we have no picture pictures of the construction of that line in our collection. This is a picture of the line between Bogor and Bandung. Uh, after the establishment of the state-owned railways, the railway network was steadily developing on Java, Madura and Sumatra because of the construction works, both by the government and through private enterprises. Not only freight transport, but also passenger transport was expanding rapidly. The introduction of the cheap fare of one cent per kilometer for a local population was a major boost for that. Soon the train was an accepted means of transport that was used by all layers of society. 
En on the railway map of Java and Madura, you can see that at the end of the colonial era in 1941, there was more than 5,000 kilometers of railways on Java. On Sumatra, there were four different railway lines, which never formed a real network. Uh, the Ache line in the north, uh, and that was used for military purposes to control the rebellious Ache inhabitants. And the Daily Railway was a private company, mainly built to transport tobacco. In the south of Sumatra, there was a line of the state-owned railways. And uh, the Ombilin line in the west was mainly built for transport of coals out of the Ombilin coal mines. This was also a state-owned railway company. Well, in our, in our collection are um, several photographs of the constructions of these railway lines. And on the left, you can see a picture of the construction of the Latavia and Osos border between Jakarta and Krama. And on the right, you can see a picture of the start of the construction of the Daily uh, Railway Company near Nabuan in East Sumatra. Of course, we also have pictures of rolling stock. Uh, the locomotives and a lot of coaches were built in Duro and were shipped to Java and Sumatra. On the left, you can see a photograph of the first locomotive of the NIS, which was built in 1864 in Germany by Borsig. And on the right, you can see a photograph of an important builder, builder of locomotives in the Netherlands, Terkspoor, in 1990. This manufacturer has built locomotive 385 in Amsterdam for the NIS. But besides photographs, we also have one real locomotive in our collection. In 1981, the Indonesian government donated locomotive number 22 of the 1600 series to the Dutch Railway Museum as a token of friendship. This locomotive was built for Staatsvoorwegen in 1928 by the manufacturer Bergspoor in Amsterdam. In 1981, this locomotive was given the name of Bergkoningin or Sriguru because it has sat for a long time in the mountainous regions of Java. Sri Gunu, this locomotive, is now on display in one of our permanent experiences called Steel Monsters. Together with one of our other important locomotives, a very heavy steam locomotive of the series 6300, it has a permanent place in this experience. Here our visitors can make a dog ride along several locomotives and trains. It is a lot of fun and it's quite exciting, but in my opinion it's not ideal because the visitors don't capture the interesting story behind these locomotives in this way. Maybe in future it will be possible to show this locomotive with more attention to the interesting background and context. Beside one real locomotive, we have a few train models in our collection. On the left, you can see a train model of locomotive Javanek of the series 800 of the Staatsvoorwegen, which was very famous in that time because it had not more than six axes. It was built by Rijkspoor in Amsterdam and Hanomach in Germany in 1912. And on the right, you can see another very interesting model, which is built in 1900 in the workshop Maju. It's a postal coach complete with toilets and a sorting cabinet for the postal conductors. And very interesting here is the mail bag exchange system of this coach. Along the track around Jakarta, there were wayside, wayside standards with nets from its mail bags were fished with a hook while the train kept moving. This model is now on display in our temporary exhibition about postal trains and carriages. The oldest model of a carriage of our collection is a model built in the workshop of Bogor in 1882. It's an exact copy of the coaches that were used by Staatsvoorwegen in that period. It has a first class compartment with leather sofas. On the right, you can see that. And in the second class department are comfortable wooden and rattan seats. 
And in the third and cheapest class, there are simple wooden banks for third class passengers. In the third class of its carriages, carriages is also a closed compartment, especially for women. Uncompanied women who would rather not sit together with strange men in one compartment could take a seat here. The coach has a toilet, lemon nets, and balconies on both ends. The roof and ceiling of the first and second class have been equipped with lamella grids to generate extra ventilation. This model was exhibited at the Colonial Export Trade Fair in Amsterdam in 1883. It now has a permanent place in our exhibition of model trains called the Model Warehouse. Well, there is a lot to say about the different coaches uh, for different passengers in the Dutch Indies. The most luxurious trains were especially built for European passengers, like this photograph of uh, passengers of the cruise to Franconia shows. These passengers traveled from Bangdung to Yogyakarta in a touristical panorama coach. Also, sultans and governors had their own coaches. On the left, you can see a picture of the coach of the Sultan of Delhi, built by the Dutch manufacturer Bijnus in Haarlem in 1900. On the right, you can see a photograph of the Dutch government in the Dutch Indies, built also by Bijnus in 1891. In 1990, a new train for the governor general was built, this time not in the Netherlands, but in the workshop in Banden of the Staatsvoorwegen. On this film fragment, made in 1929, you can see the train of the governor, governor riding between Jakarta and Surabaya at the trajects of the Eidaagse Express. This train of the governor consists of more carriages and is saved, and it now on display in the uh, Museum of Transportation in Tamamina in Jakarta. I will show you, show you the moving images of this. Carriages and the locomotive. Oh, sorry. sorry, I did something wrong. So, the carriages of the Governor General and the locomotive. Carried the carriages. And these images are for, from Beeld and Geluid, the Museum of the Moving Image in the Netherlands. And it's very impressive to see the locomotive given to carriages. But it's very symbolic that the same train, the same carriages that was built for the Dutch governor general was used in 1945 by Sukarno. This picture shows his freedom train ride in December 1945 to make publicity for his fight for freedom and the abolishment of the colonial system against the Dutch. He therefore made a train ride, ride in the train of the governor. This picture of the entourage in the panorama car was taken by Johnny Floria for Life magazine. But there were more passengers than governors and sultans. I found different travel reports which give an interesting impression of the traveling conditions by trains in colonial era. One of these reports is from Lucy van Rennesse who wrote different books around 1900 under her pen name, Delilah. Most of the time, she traveled by train. As a woman of mixed cultures, she used first, second, and third class coaches, and has written a lot about the fun, but also about annoying things she experiences in the train. For example, she was really afraid of some male passengers when the train passed a dark tunnel. And she noted that some passengers in the second and third class were very, very noisy. She therefore had to flee regularly to the first class to travel more quietly. 
Some luxurious trains had reservation for gardens where guests could eat and drink. These were especially meant for first-class travelers. By the way, the food in this restoration department was often very Dutch. They served, for example, typical Dutch foods as pie soup and hot pots. In 1929, the connection between Jakarta and Surabaya was improved. It was possible to travel in one day or one night between these cities with the so-called Eidasa Express. On the left, you can see a flyer to promote this line, and on the right, you see a picture of the interior of the restoration compartment in a train of this line. In second-class railway coaches were cheaper than the first-class uh, carriages, and everyone who could afford it could buy a second-class ticket. This class was therefore as well for European and Dutch passengers as for Chinese, well-to-do Japanese, and people of mixed cultures. On the left, you can see a picture of the interior of the second-class coaches, and on the right, you see a few female sellers of food and snacks to passengers of a second-class carriage on the Semarang Joana tramway around 1935. Tickets for the third and sometimes fourth-class passengers were the cheapest. Most local inhabitants of Java and Sumatra traveled in the third class. It was really cheap for them to travel by train because at the end of the 19th century, the Dutch government decided to stimulate the people in Java and Sumatra to travel by train and they had only to pay one cent per kilo kilometer and were allowed to take with them everything they could carry by picolon or stave. No wonder that the train became a very popular means of transport. On the left you can see a picture of the left you can see a picture on the location of at Kurosari station. And the right picture shows the interior with simple wooden banks of third class carriage. Then uh, the picture also gave an impression of the personal. Uh, the Staatsvoorwege, uh, state owned railways, were the biggest railway company in the Dutch Indies. But there were a lot of smaller and bigger private railway companies as well, like the NIS, the SJS, the SCS, BOS, Daily uh, Railway Company, and so on. And all these railway companies needed all sorts of employees, railway workers for the construction and maintenance of the lines, signalmen, station masters, officers, engineers, drawers, engine drivers, and so on. The different railway companies offered a lot of work for the local population, for people of mixed culture, in Dutch we call them Indies people, Indies Mensa. Chinese and European people. Uh, in the colonial system, the highest ranks were definitely appropriate for the European or Dutch engineers and supervisors. The local inhabitants mostly worked in the lower ranks as workers in workshops, track workers, and lower officers on stations. On the left, you can see a picture of the personal of the NIS workshop in Samara. The Japanese workers and draftmen are sitting on the ground. And in the middle, in their white suits, you can see the European supervisors of the workshop. Behind them, different officers of mixed cultures. The men with the white uniforms usually did the paperwork, while the men with dark uniforms and in traditional costumes did the manual work. On the right, we see a signal man in a signal box pulling down the lever. Beside him is a supervisor in his white uniform. It is, by the way, remarkable that the interior of this signal box is practically the same as the signal boxes in the Netherlands. Even the device with the lever is the same, same made by the Altmarsche Handel in Dichting in Altmar in the north of the Netherlands. Since the beginning of railways, uh, Japanese and Sumatran people were known as excellent engine drivers. On the left, you can see the engine driver and his stoker. On the right of this picture, you can see a man in a white uniform, which was probably the head of the traction depot. The locomotive is standard locomotive number 22 of the Danish Spoorwegmaatschappij, made by manufacturer Richard Hartmann in Chemnitz in 1902. On the right, you can see a tram near the stop in 
Pujara, of, of the line between Samara and Joana of the SJS around 19 and under 210. This is the only picture in our collection with a conductor on it. And if you look a little bit closer, you can see this may be a Japanese conductor. There were many Japanese conductors, but in the colonial system, they only were allowed to check tickets in the third class. According to the European directors of the railway companies, they had no authority to control the European passengers in the second and first class. So the conductors in third, these classes had to be also European. Between 1902 and 1907, the NIS built a new headquarter in Samara, Lavang Selu, or the house with a thousand doors. The design was from the famous Dutch architects Klinkhammer and Allenbach. After the opening of the building, the personal post before the thousand doors. The carriers in the front, and a lot of writers, drawers, excisemen, people of the calculation department, etc. Interesting to know that the NIST also had a headquarter in The Hague, where the Dutch board of and director were housed. All the private companies had their boards in the Netherlands. Only the Staats Voorwege had a, a headquarter in Indonesia, in Bandung. And we can see the interior of that headquarter here on the next slide. The headquarters of the Staats Voorwege were since the 1920s housed in Bandung. On the right, you can see a picture of the gate of the building, made in 1928. And on the left, you can see the interior of the so-called Registratur, the registration department, where all the correspondence of the railway company was kept up. Here was the middle management, which consisted mainly of people of mixed cultures. And in 1927, we also see that women worked in administrative jobs, just as in the Netherlands at that time. Top positions in the railway companies were only available for Dutch people or for people of other European countries. A good example is Mr. Frans den Hollander, who was the famous general director of the Dutch railways after the Second World War. He started his career on Java after studying mechanical engineering at the Technical University in Delft in the Netherlands. During his study, he assisted Professor Franco with the design of the series 1000 locomotives for the Staats Voorwege of Java. That gave him the idea to travel to Java to see these locomotives working in real life. He started as an engineer of a workshop in the Staats Voorwege, but soon became the head engineer of that company. In 1936, he even became the head of the expectation of the lines of the Western Java. On the left picture, we see that Hollander at an unknown station in the 20s. He is the third man left in the front row. On the right, you can see that Hollander with his car and his little dog in front of his house of Java. We don't have any pictures in that collection that are taken during the Second World War. The Dutch and European officers of the railway companies were sent to Japanese concentration camps or were taken prisoner of war and had to do forced labor. Making photographers, photographs was strictly forbidden during Japanese occupation. So pictures of this period, period are very rare. But we have photographs of the time after the Second World War during the freedom fight of the Indonesian people and the colonial war of the Dutch who didn't want to give up their colony. In this period, the railway lines became very important for the Dutch and for the Indonesian freedom fighters to transport soldiers and military equipment. On the left, you can see the department of the Dutch Marine on the locomotive at Surabaya Station. On the right picture, on top, you can see the sabotage of a train by Indonesian freedom fighters and on the line between Jakarta and Surabaya. On the right picture below, you can see the slogans against the Dutch on a tram in Jakarta. As I've shown, our collection consists mainly of photographs, but besides pictures, we also have a lot of documents in our library, like annual reports, studies of railway lines, regulations, technical drawings of locomotives, and so on. We also have timetables, as the one below on the left, slide, left on the slide, and flyers, as the one shown in the right, uh, on the right of this 
this uh, slide. Besides documents, we also have some posters of railways in Dutch Indies. On the left, you can see a school poster of the railway bridge of the Anai cloth of the west coast of Sumatra. On the right, you can see a poster of the famous, famous Dutch architect Berlage, made in 1891 to promote the same railway line on the west coast of Sumatra. And we finally also have some small objects of the railways in the Dutch Indies. For example, we have stamps, medals, bells of some stations, train tickets, and information signs. In uh, 2017, the railways in Indonesia existed 150 years. And to remember the first train in Java, we made an exhibition at the Sporen van Varangsmanacht, or Emerald Tracks to show our collection for the first time. It was very successful, and there are inside and outside our museum people who encourage us to make a permanent exhibition about the railways in the Dutch Indies. And I really hope we can do so, but I'm not sure when it will happen. For the exhibition and the book, I had to do a lot of research in our own library and in the National Archive in The Hague. In the archive in The Hague are a lot of resources of all the private companies. For example, I've read all the letters of Mr. De Bordes and sent to the board of the NIS between uh, 1864 and 1869. Uh, very interesting source in our own collection are more than 20 audio tapes with interviews held in 1989 with people who worked at the railways before the independence of Indonesia in 1949. These interviews give a lot, lot of personal information about different careers of people who are working in the middle and higher classes of the railways. I have to emphasize that all these sources reflect the thoughts, opinions and worldview of the Dutch during the colonial period and not of the Indonesian people, of course. We have, uh, as I've said, uh, approximately 4,000 pictures and objects of the rail and tramway lines in the Dutch Indies. At this moment, we are very busy with a big project to digitize and describe our complete collection, consisting of more than 200,000 objects in total. It's our intention to publish all photographs on our website, but not earlier than 2024, when we have finished the registration of our collection. So maybe during this process, we will find new unknown photographs or objects and surprises which expose new aspects of the railway history of the Dutch Indies. So I, uh, that was my story and um, I only have a few minutes left. So I'm curious if you may have questions or remarks. Hi, Evelyn. Hello, Evelyn. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you. Yes, I can hear you. Hi, Evelyn. Hi, hi. Voice? Yes, I can hear you. Do you hear me? Hello? Hi, Evelyn. Hi. Sorry. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Can we open uh, one or two questions? This is okay? Yes, but I've only left a few minutes. So, um, of course, you can uh, pose your questions. But, yeah, um, okay. I 
Oke, okay, I, I will offering to yeah. participant. Mungkin ada yang tanya mengenai apa presentasi dari Evelyn? Monggo kalau ada yang tanya. Monggo. So, Evelyn, uh, for the first time, uh, I want introduce myself. Uh, uh, my name is Nevi from Surabaya. Yes. Uh, I, just I just have, have one question, question for you. Can you tell us about uh, your collection, the locomotive uh, Java Star Spur Wagon number 1622? Locomotive Mallet. Yes. Thank you. Evelyn. Yes. Uh, ada koleksi yang bisa di, di, di cek secara online atau enggak? Uh, hi Evelyn. This is hi. one question uh, yes. from Indonesia. Yes. It's the uh, it's possible if the Spurwek Museum collection can be accessed by online. Uh, just tools. Um, we are now yeah, in the process of for document or data. We are now in the process of digitizing and describing our complete collection of more than 200,000 objects and documents. And uh, we are doing this this year and next year. And after that, I hope it will be uh, possible to publish all the information from all the photographs um, online. But it's only uh, possible after this big project, so it's possible uh, to start with publishing uh, uh, photographs online after 2023. Did you understand it? Yeah. Uh, I hope it was clear, my answer was clear. So after 2023, it uh, will be possible to publish our collection. Yeah, yeah. this is, this is uh, clear your answer. Thank you for your question. Sorry, thank, thank you for your answer. Yes. Okay, maybe any question? Yeah, hello? Ya, ya. Uh, Ardian, uh, Ardian, from Steam Soul. Uh, thank you, Evelyn, for your presentation. Uh, I have uh, some question, maybe three question about uh, your presentation. So very nice uh, sharing uh, to us in Indonesia. The first question is, uh, you said about the first. Uh, development of uh, railways in Indonesia and train in Indonesia uh, in route of Semarang. Uh, how about the first operation of a train that uh, promote economic and also transportation mass? Uh, if there is differentiation of the train model for passenger, 
or in the trade uh, staff. And the second question, uh, how about the development of uh, railways in Indonesia during uh, Japan, Japanese uh, invasion in the, in the era of uh, Japanese invasion? And the third question, uh, Dutch government uh, promotes and also uh, give uh, development of uh, railways. How about the operation is a private company or by Dutch royal government? Uh, thank you. These are a lot of questions in, in one time to answer. Um, well, um, I don't think I can answer the second question because uh, the railways in Japanese period is completely uh, is a whole story to tell. And there is a written book about this period by Jan de Bruyn. It's very interesting, and uh, but it is in Dutch, uh, but it's very interesting and he tells more about this period, the Second World War, and, and uh, I think it would be go far too far to uh, tell more about uh, because I only left one minute or something. So your question is so big that I can tell it in uh, one minute. Uh, the other questions, I didn't understand your first question, but um, can you repeat that? Okay, thank you, Evelyn. It's quite difficult because I didn't understand uh, the first question. Second question is a complete story. Uh, maybe uh, we need one or two hours to talk about it. Um, I think uh, because my time is, uh, well, sorry for that, but I just have to go to do other things. I'm very busy at this moment. Um, so maybe we can make the appointment that if there are questions of the public or the participants, they can ask them to, to me via Agu, and I will answer them by mail. Is that a good idea? Did you hear it? Yes, Evelyn. Okay, I think that's the best way because um, I have to go. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Evelyn, for coming. Our invitation to discuss related with the yeah. Dutch in this collection in Dutch Railway Museum. And we, 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 we appreciate for your time to discuss with us. Once again, thank you, Evelyn. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attend our discussion. Maybe in the next time we can arrange again uh, to discuss with you as representation uh, from the Spurwek Museum. Yes, and uh, what I've said is that uh, if you have questions, you maybe can ask them by mail because uh, this month I'm very busy also with the project of the registration of collection. So, um, well, I, I will see and I try to answer or give you the information where you can find the answer yourselves in the archives or in the books. Is that okay? Okay, thank you very much mm -hmm. for having me and um, I wish everybody a very good time. Yeah, thank you very much, Evelyn. Okay, bye-bye.